Okay, hello. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Lisa, for the wonderful introduction and your talk this morning that our things will relate to a little bit. Um, Lisa and I have met 32 years ago, so uh, we're so it's nice to be back on this topic today is how we apply actually the European Daylight Standard to enhance some urban environments with densification. So sustainability requires a lot of changes and people starting to build in uh, existing building structures. So here's a big courtyard and people start to put buildings in there and we need to see what impact that has. So we have now looked at uh, some simulations where we've used the different criteria of the daylighting standard, uh, looking at daylight as the daylight factor on the reference plane uh, where we have different levels. We're looking at the view out where we have different steps. We assess the direct sunlight and we assess uh, glare as one of the... We used a reference office um, and where we vary the distance uh, of the neighboring facade, we vary the height of the building, and we're looking at a particular area in the building which is six meter deep, and in this case, 41.8 meters long, and we're looking at the working space area in here. Other areas are circulation and storage, where you put your bookshelves and other things like that, and just to make it a little easier, we calculated only for one DGP point in the front of the facade. Uh, you see a little bit about the other uh, factors that we're using there. As simulation tool, we used a new tool that is being developed in Sweden uh, called Aftabrab, uh, and Aftab means sun in Persian. And the uh, author, uh, Majid Miri, uh, works in Sweden. He is developing this tool, and we thought we'd try it out because it seemed to make a lot of sense. We had uh, extra help from a intern that helped us doing a lot of the simulations. She spent lots of time on it, and you can see a little bit. We modeled, uh, modeled as location Hamburg in Germany, sort of as a more or less central location in all of Europe uh, to see how it works there. There are some uh, of the additional parameters in there that we used. And then we looked at the daylight factor and we tried to see how can we actually display this so people can actually follow. So here are the requirements. Minimum target illuminance 300, which then relates to a daylight factor of 2.2. Um, but at the same time, we need 100% uh, or no, 95% of the surface area uh, that's meeting also 100 lux. So this is the, the first one there. Uh, then we go to the 65% uh, where we need to achieve um, 300 lux. And then it's 46 for the next level at 500 and 30.7% uh, for the next one. So you see this here. We also look at the, the other factors uh, one by one. So the next one is recommendation for daily sunlight exposure. Um, where we have um, minimum, medium, and high, and these are the hours that we have, and we use the measurement point in front of the facade for that. So now you see uh, the different um, numbers here. Uh, so here we have 9.66 hours for that particular point, so we're fulfilling that so it stays green. Uh, then we go into the view out, and there we have a minimum horizontal side angle of 14 degrees, 28 for medium, 56 for the next one, and then the outside distance that you can actually see from the facade to the neighboring buildings between 6, 20, and 50 meters. And then you see how these actually work here. And the last one is DGP, where we have minimum of 0.45, so that means 45% of the people will likely experience uh, some discomfort clear. For the high one, it's only 35% of the people experience that. And in this case, we have 0.3, so we're actually meeting all of them. So this is just an example of what are the factors that we're using. And it stays green if it meets the factors, and it goes red when it doesn't. So now we're looking at the place, and we've done a little bit of icons for the different ones here, so you can see it a little bit more easily. And so we're now starting with 8 meter distance between the buildings, 3.4 meter height. And you can see uh, a little bit uh, how the daylight distribution works there. Uh, but we're already seeing that some of the higher targets are not met even with this low building when we have a facade that close. When we then increase it, you see that more of the things are getting red. Um, and 
so you can see sort of the progression. I go a little bit faster on that, so it becomes a little bit of a movie uh, when you're looking at it. You can maybe in the presentation uh, later when it's made available, uh, see it a little bit more clearly. Uh, the numbers are also a little bit uh, hard to read at the end. Um, so then we're moving to uh, 14 meter distance, and then of course you're meeting targets a little bit more easily, and we're increasing, and you see how the uh, daylight levels change at the front of the facade, and you see also the numbers changing up there, um, but the red parts don't really change that much. It just reduces uh, the percentage in the different parts. So then we go to 20 meters, and then a little bit more is green in the fields, uh, and we move it up, um, and increasing the heights and more things become red or the percentage numbers are actually reducing. So these were uh, all the different simulations that we did and what are some of the conclusions that we're actually working with. Okay, in the densely built up areas we have uh, obstructions angles that are above uh, 10 degrees. So that means it's nearly impossible to reach the daylight factor targets for the medium and high performance targets, despite the fact that we use 25% glazing area in relation to the floor. Uh, we look at the view from the sky in different positions and that is very limited. So we get a low circadian stimulus, uh, especially in morning hours, and that could potentially result in poorer occupant health and well-being. Uh, we're achieving the minimum daylight factor for 95% of the room, um, but it's nearly impossible uh, with windows in one facade only. So we therefore use the defined work area instead of the whole floor area as one thing, and that's commonly done in practice as well, that they really look only at the parts that are closer to the window as work areas. And we need to look at outside view and sunlight exposure, which is, of course, severely restricted. And we know that view adds a lot of benefit, as we've heard uh, from several presentations today. So we would like to maintain that. Um, on the other hand, discomfort glare is mitigated by some of these higher buildings because you just don't get as much sunlight that has the potential for giving you high glare factors. So some recommendations from that. Um, I suggest that we adjust the window size according to the placement in the facade. So we have larger windows in the lower floors and progressively make the windows smaller uh, to account for some of the extra daylighting so we don't get overheating in the top floors but we get more daylight and more view out from the lower ones. Uh, sometimes it might help to have what they called, uh, Vivian called the kick panel this morning uh, that we uh, maybe glaze that so that you can actually see a little bit more down from the uh, lower parts of the view. Uh, we would like to have daylight openings in more facades than one, if possible. So this is from a study that some of my uh, bachelor students did a while ago um, on looking at school lighting and introducing uh, different facades. So I grew up in a school uh, that had windows on both sides and I really loved it. Um, we can also play with one facade and daylight in the back so you have much more even distribution in the room or you can also integrate some shading devices and working mostly with east, um, sorry, with north and south facing facades rather than east and west facing facade. When you do the simulations, clearly define what the work areas are and let also the owners of the building know so that they don't get tempted to put a lot of extra desks in the back of the room where there isn't enough daylight, where people are not very uh, satisfied. And then the other one is to really look at where we place the windows to allow the best possible view connections to the outside. And also looking at how we articulate the windows rather than having perpendicular facade corners or for the window reveal that we splay that because it allows you to get a much larger angle of the view through that space. And we've done that in a number of buildings together with Real Denia, which has funded a, a number of projects where we can really see the benefit of that, that you really get a lot more. And the disadvantage uh, that we perhaps perceive with thermal insulation is actually very, very small. Uh, at the most, we had sort of 2% uh, differences in, in some of the things for the uh, U-value factor. And also, when you deal with urban environments, make sure that you do get to see a little bit of the sky where it is ever possible and also a view down to the ground. So, um, and then the last one, 
as Max was saying, also the daylight standard is really a good means to ensure that we maintain some quality in our building, especially when we're going through some urban densification processes. And I also recommend that we should perhaps add a requirement to new construction documentation that it must include the effect of our new building, not only on our own building, but on the neighboring buildings that are surrounding us, so that we also uh, judge the impact that we have on those. I think that uh, was it, and we would like to thank Majid uh, for allowing us to use the software. You can find some more information on the software at this link, and we especially would like to uh, thank Kinga, who did her master's in Sweden also and had some exposure to the program to really help us going through the endless uh, simulations that we've done here. Um, thank you very much for listening. I hope you could use that information and get encouraged to work with the daylighting standard. It's a good thing that we have the daylighting standard and uh, actually having a basis, a common basis that we can discuss. It's always easier to improve things when you have a common basis across Europe than if you don't have anything. So with that, I'll leave you uh, with these thoughts. Thank you very much.